Okay, hello everyone. So my name is Maxim Blinov. Uh, I currently work at Embercosm, and I would just like to talk about a project I did at one point just after first year university to teach myself a bit more about hardware. So at the time I considered myself more of a software junkie and but it sort of annoyed me that when you write software, you know, you can you start off with a high level C and you think, oh that's not low level enough. I really, really want to know what's going on. You go C, you go assembler, you write linker scripts, but it's still you still want to know what is going on in those transistors. And so I decided, okay, got to put an end to this and get down to the real hardware details. And I thought, well, it'd be great to pick something that's kind of straightforward, something from maybe 45 years ago. And the Intel 8080 was a, was a, a good choice to turn out to model a CPU. So to get started, a little bit about this processor. It's now uh, 45 years old, 8-bit data bus, 16-bit address bus, 6,000 transistors at the time, and actually internally it uses a 4-bit ALU. So it takes about eight cycles, I think, for a single ad operation. But that's great because it means it's really easy to implement for a student who knows, has no idea what they're doing. And so we've got a two megahertz clock rate, of course, an FPGA. It's, we can set the clock rate to whatever we want. And so it's no hardware multiplication division. It's all very straightforward. So it's perfectly suitable for FPGA. So a little bit more detail now. So the AT80 has eight registers and one accumulator. So this is what we refer to at this time as an accumulator-based CPU. That is to say, all the ALU operations have to be on the A register. That's the way the, the guys are designed it at the time to save on transistor count. We've got a stack pointer, which we can push things and pop things from, but you can't do any stack pointer relative operations. It's, it's really simplistic. And pretty much all, op all opcodes are one byte. Uh, in fact, there's a, a table you can find online where it's like an eight by eight or a grid, and you've got all the instructions on there. It's, it's great. So, and now about the FPGA, I happen to use a board called the Nexus 4 DDR by Digilent, and uh, obviously it's great because you've got uh, the VGA output and the, a USB HID interface, which actually converts it to a PS2 format for you. Uh, there's a chip on the other side which does the conversion. And uh, it's more than capable. You've got, uh, actually, uh, this is the central chip here, and down here is the DDR2 memory. I didn't actually use that. I think the controller to control access to the DDR2 memory chip is more complicated than the system on chip I designed. So let's use the onboard stuff. And there's about one megabyte of onboard memory. That's more than 64K, so we're good there. So now a little bit more about the design flow. So if any of you are sort of uh, not new to that, you're probably, I'm preaching to the choir here, some people. But so you start off with a simulation and you want to always prove your hardware design works in the simulator. Otherwise, it becomes really difficult to debug later. You don't have any printf statements here. Even on an embedded platform, you want to uh, shine an LED. It's like, say, if your debugger it doesn't, you, you don't want to set up your debugger, you're too lazy. You can at least flash an LED on an embedded board. But here, if you want to flash an LED, that's a lot of work. You got you to gotta have a, you know, a, a clocked circuit with latches. And if you want it to blink periodically, you have to set the timer. And when a timer runs out, then we turn it off. All of a sudden, you need to debug that. And so we always want to see, you have the, so this particular example is where, you probably can't see from the back, but a lot of these symbols, these uh, signals are just noise, but at the bottom here, we're uh, loading an immediate to a register, and then I'm just moving from the accumulator into each B, C, D, E register. And we can see the value change from zero to FF after a, a few clock cycles here. And you can see that, okay, actually it works. So the simulator agrees that it works. And that's a pretty good sign that you've got the, you're on the right track. Then we step on, when you do synthesis, the tool actually maps it into uh, an abstract sort of uh, net list of, of the logic description of the, the logic schematic of your, uh, the description that you've, you gave in the input. So nothing's set in stone yet. You still haven't run the implementation and the layout, but you can sort of poke around. And this is just an example I gave of some of the logic it generated for, I think the uh, memory access controller. So to get into some more detail, now then the implementation step actually maps each concrete logic cell onto, this, the, onto your FPGA and lays it, lays it out. And actually, I think this was about, this is the entire system, well, system on chip, 8080 with some more, you know, some peripherals is about 2% usage. It's nothing. Block RAM was 25% because uh, there's not that much block RAM, and I ended up using 64K plus some for the uh, video memory. So that's what you see here on these columns. Those are the block RAMs. And uh, conclusion is need a bigger processor project, I'm not using enough resources. And this is uh, the, I made a map of the, this is the system topology. So at the bottom you've got the processor, obviously it doesn't live on its own. The processor has an address bus, a data bus, uh, it needs to inter interact with the world and you do that with memory mapping. And so with the 88 you have this curious situation at the time it was, uh, 
opt the, the optimal solution was to have two buses, the address bus and the port bus. And the port bus you would typically use for sort of peripherals, sort of like character devices in it, like in Linux. And the, for, for you use the uh, address bus for when you need to have a region of memory. So, and of course, with the system designers, this is great. I don't have to read someone's data sheet. I set the rules. I say where all the memory maps go. And so you can, uh, I happen to uh, put the VRAM at a particular address and the port, there's a seven segment controller which you can write to a port and it, you'll see the, that particular hex uh, value come up on, the, on your actual uh, board. And so that's great, you can actually debug it now, but it took a lot of effort to get there. And then if anything isn't backed by a peripheral, we just go, it, it gets backed by the, the actual onboard uh, block RAM primitive. And so that's what's going on there. And then there's a memory access arbiter, which is basically an if else if statement, which says, okay, if we're in this range, send it to that guy. If we're in this range, send it to that guy. If, it, if it's not mapped, we uh, just return zero. No, no, I wrote all of this. Yep. So, and so now we've got the question, okay, we've got the hardware, but it, it, and okay, now I want to actually program it. How do we do that? And there's actually two ways. So because we have the whole entire description of the hardware available to us, we can actually embed straight in the hardware description, okay, I want this program and just bake it in. So in this case, with VHDLs, and one nice feature is that it's a typed language and you can have arrays of data types and you can get all, you can have quite a nice looking description. So here's a, a particular example, which just tests the push instruction. So we load some values and then push them to the stack. And we can actually embed this in the description and say, okay, run this program. The problem is you're going to have to run the entire synthesis implementation place and route steps. And the bigger your design, the, that's going to take a lot of time. It's not unheard of to, for this stuff to take hours on end. So that's not great. We need some kind of uh, a different way. But, but the advantage of this is that it's completely independent of your device. So th this is just box standard VHDL. It's, it's, it, any synthesis tool will be able to work with that. What we can do instead is run the synthesis run the implementation, and then we can open it in the tool and actually select those uh, block RAM components. And each block RAM has a, an attribute. This is now vendor specific. So this is the trade-off you get. You get maybe locked in a bit into Xilinx, but on the other hand, you actually get a convenient way to program your device. They have these attributes, which is the, the actual content of the memory that it'll, flat, it'll program when you program the chip. And we can actually take that assembly program, get the output, and then literally set the appropriate rows with a, some TTL commands. And now we've told the tool, okay, this implementation that you have, you've laid it out, great, but can you just change that particular property and reflash it? So finally, hello world, after months of work probably. <laughs> this is possibly the most difficult hello world ever made. But so we, the assembly on the left, this is 8080 assembly, uh, not much to it really. We've got a C, C, you know, zero terminated string. And at the top, we've, we set a symbol, which is the VRAM, which is at 8000. And we know it's at 8,000 because we can open the VHDL file and see, oh, okay, there's an if 8,000 then sent to VRAM. So, and then we just loop over, start VRAM and the string, and until we get zero, we uh, just send the character that we get. And those square glyphs just mean that it's a, there's no, no ASCII representable character there. Now we can get, actually start testing functionality. Now, because we did the simulation before, we actually now have some faith that it should work, and indeed, uh, now we're actually calling a function, and when you call a function, the 8080 will push the return address and the flags, and then jump to address. And when you do a return, it'll pop the state program status word, and the and it'll return back to the address that's on the stack. So that's really a good sign that actually a, a pretty complicated piece of digital logic is not broken. And then finally, we, uh, we saw all those ASCII characters. We'd like to clear the screen with something that's actually not horrible, and doesn't blind us. So we can write a, a clear instruction, and at this point, it's just software, so we can pretty much write whatever, whatever we want. And this, in this particular case, this was testing another feature, which is that it's an 8-bit microprocessor, but we have 80 by 40 characters to clear. That's 4,800. That doesn't fit in a byte. So we actually need to do some, we need to do two comparisons. So we compare the lower byte, if it's over, we need, then we need to check if it's overflowed or not the second time. And if indeed it has, then we know we finished clearing it. Otherwise we need to jump back. So that's what the, what the FCLS have lower. So we need to do two checks which again, you know, puts a, a little bit of, like a, a test the CPU that it's actually function. And so that's pretty much all I had to say. In conclusion, writing system on chip, system, 
on chip designs with an old school CPU is a great way to learn because you don't get bogged down in the details. If you say I wanted to do something like an ARM or some other, or like the i386, you would just spend years trying to get that thing to, to behave. There's just too much complexity and too much legacy in that. But with something from quite simple, and even RISC-V, it's not unheard of that people uh, write a RISC-V core in an evening. So, uh, and modern FPGAs, they're, in the recent years, they've really progressed, they've become a lot more capable and powerful. And lastly, 8080 assembly is not a great programming platform, I have discovered. <laughs> It is, I really underestimated. I thought, oh, the hardware will be the difficult bit, bit, and then I'll just, I'll write all sorts of cool programs. It's really tricky with the 8080. There are not many instructions. The stack is only for pushing and popping from. You can't do anything relative to it. And uh, even simple instructions get really difficult. So thank you very much for your attention. You. Yep. How does the speed of your processor compare to the 45-year-old uh, 8080? So that's an interesting question. At this point, I uh, have a, something to admit, which is that actually this microprocessor that I did, it was a mic I microcoded it, and certain instructions take 25 cycles. I am sorry. <laughs> but I, it could be optimized a lot more because in the microcode, I did it just you know, one thing at a time, just so, not, just so I could keep track of it mentally. So it's, the original was two megahertz. That's 100 instructions, 100,000 instructions per second, I think. This FPGA is 100 megahertz, so that's 50 times faster. But because on the 8080, it might take eight cycles to do something, but on mine, it takes 20. So then you divide that again, so it turns out maybe, oh, I don't know, 25 times faster. It should be better than that. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, if there are no more questions, thank you very much.